see a couple more people coming in here. So if you come in late, don't worry. Just, just feel free to unmute if you want to interrupt me and I will get started. For those of you who have um, no clue who I am, let me go ahead and share this again. All right, hopefully you guys can, can hear me fine and see my screen. Um, I'm going to talk today about digitizing the intent. Uh, that's a strange way to put it. It is a very geeky way to put it, right? It's a, it's a way an engineer would, would talk. That's because I'm an engineer. That's what I was most of my, my uh, professional life. And um, it, it is, this is an approach that we have found very effective. It is something I don't see a lot of. I don't see a lot of this happening in the space. And it's something that we are actually trying very hard to codify and get, uh, get taught in the, the OT schools, probably first, uh, maybe speech pathology second, and also in the engineering schools. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the idea of digitizing the intent is, is pretty straightforward, and it came about through our work um, at AT Makers. And hopefully you'll find this useful and, and give you a slightly different perspective uh, when you're trying to solve the problems that are facing our AT users today. Um, a little bit about me. Um, so first, speaker disclosures. Um, uh, I kind of already said this, but I am the co-founder of Lesson Picks with my wife, Lori. Uh, if you use Lesson Picks, I wrote all the software that runs it. Um, I also founded atmakers.org, uh, which is a charity that we'll talk about quite a bit today. I do have several um, first teams that I work with. First is a robotics program for high school kids, um, and I am a mentor for them. Uh, and that is, a, and actually I have a relationship with FIRST as well. And then uh, Brian Whitmer and I started COVID Speak in 2020 to uh, try to help with COVID-19. There are some uh, hospitals that will uh, that are, are using that today, some of them in the Pennsylvania area, so you might uh, come in contact with that as well. One minute about me, uh, I really won't go on about me, it's not that important, but a lot of people don't realize when they meet me, a lot of people think that I'm a speech path, which is, I, I actually, that means that I'm, I'm fooling you well. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a speech path. In fact, I have zero training in um, any therapeutic clinical type work. Um, I, I work with a lot of speech paths and I've done a lot of work on AT makers that makes me uh, aware of, of how they work. But I'm actually an engineer. I'm a software developer. Uh, I spent about 20 years in software development uh, with Perot Systems, Ross Perot's consulting company, and worked with a ton of Fortune 500 companies around the world. Uh, about every year or two, I'd have a brand new challenge, which makes me have a really thin knowledge of an awful lot of industries, which turns out is a good place to be these days. Um, about 10 years ago, I started LessonPix.com with my wife, Lori, who's a special ed teacher and fantastic artist. Uh, which introduced me to AT and got me really grumpy when I would look at technology that seemed like it should not be so prohibit prohibitively expensive and inaccessible. Uh, inaccessible. And um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot at, at conferences like ATIA and Closing the Gap about how we got there and, and what I might be able to do to help, which is why I founded atmakers.org uh, to try and um, bring some more technical skills to bear on the, um, on the AT industry or the, on the AT problem, let's put it that way. Changing the industry is another story. We're, we're not going to try and solve that one today. Um, I've talked a couple, time about, a couple times about atmakers.org. You might not know what it is. Uh, AT Makers is a charity, 501c3 charity that, um, and more importantly, it's a community of people who are working to solve AT problems. Uh, on, a, uh, on an individual basis. So we are primarily coalesced around a group on Facebook, which I, I really don't like the fact that it's Facebook because I hate Facebook, but it is where people find us. Um, the, the other groups are there. So the support groups for SMA and CP and uh, MS are already aggregated on Facebook. So that's where our users are. Therefore, that's kind of where we have to be. I actually lose quite a bit of technical people who just won't do Facebook. Uh, but that is primarily where we're aggregated. We're a group you can find who you can come to and say, I need to be able to, you know, turn my lights on. I need to be able to, um, I, I want to be able to, you know, fly a drone. <laughs> that's, we'll, we'll talk about that today. And bring us odd requests that um, there's not a product out there that does it. And we can put you in touch with or directly help you find um, solutions 
uh, from more a more technical side of, of the space. And so we create a lot of custom solutions. Uh, they are all free. We don't charge anybody for them. Uh, it is part of the, the charitable um, goal of, of the charity. That's what, what we do. So one of the questions here might be, uh, what is a maker? Now, it's interesting. A lot of you are makers. Uh, Lori already knows that she is. But may, the, the term maker actually came from a book called Dale Doherty. Um, it probably came from Make Magazine or before that, but he actually worked there and, and wrote the book on it. And they're kind of people who believe that they find a greater sense of ownership when they have made something or at least contributed to making something than buying it. They think they like to think that they are the opposite of consumers. They're also consumers. But the idea here is that these are people who have this amazing ability to bring into being something that simply didn't exist. And, and today, um, th that can be anything from sewing with a pattern, right? So if you're using a pattern and you're, you're, you're making a dress or whatever it is, um, to you know, Judy Schoonover, who's talking right now, and who, if you're not my president, if you hate this, go see Judy, okay? Um, because she's amazing. She, she makes things with PVC pipes and, and, and all kinds. She makes these art kits that just, they were a pile of PVC pipes, and now suddenly they're tools for somebody to be able to be creative. That, that's the idea here, right? Let, let's tap into this, this community that already exists. They already exist. They're already out there. Um, they, they're already aggregated in maker spaces around the country. They have cosplay groups and they have, they have uh, you, you name it. These folks are, are, you will find them in your community all over the place. Let's, let's go bring the AT problems to them because they need something to do, right? Other than, you know, make the rotocopter fly upside down, which, you know, that's it's my go-to because it's just a completely useless thing, but a lot of people spend time playing with them. Um, let's give them something to do with their skills. Let's give them something where they feel like they've really made an impact. Um, but this culture is there. I, I don't have to create it. It's already um, in place. We can just tap into it. And you'll notice I put a little note here that says this is an AT slide. So I, I tell you, I tell the AT groups this. I have another slide, uh, which is a geek slide. So when I'm talking to Google or I'm talking to uh, Adafruit or one of the other um, complete um, engineering side, they have no clue what assistive technology is. I, I you'll say assistive technology and they'll, they'll they'll think accessibility or they'll think they'll think whatever it is in their life that sounds like it might be AT. But they'll, they'll have no clue what we're talking about. So I'm pretty sure everybody in this audience knows what AT is. Um, I do like this little definition that says you know, non-medical technology that helps users perform everyday tasks. Uh, we don't try and do things that are therapeutic, like for exercising muscles. Uh, there might be some things right on the edge of that as far as strengthening hands, but really it's not really what we, what we do. Um, it's more about if the majority of the people, the vast majority of um, the people in the world don't need technology to, you, to do this, and you do, you need assistive technology. Okay, um, and that really does go the gamut from, you know, absolutely no tech to really high tech um, uh, technology. So what do we do? Uh, I'm going to go through some some success stories first. Oh, uh, Julie likes my uh, my AT slide. Uh, I I will make this available. You're welcome to steal anything you see me do, including even the hardware. Right, is all open source and you can make your own. So. Um, uh, you're happy to have my AT slide. Oh, would you like me to? You want to screenshot it? There you go. You can take a quick screenshot if you want. So, all right, you're welcome. Um, by the way, I do watch the chat. So if you've got a question, just just tell me. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through some sample stories, and I I, I like starting with the stories because it kind of gives you a really good um, picture of of what we're trying to do before I start lecturing you on how we're doing it and how I recommend you consider approaching it. I, I think I do have to stop this share and restart it because I need to include the audio. Yeah. So let me do this again. Um, and hopefully this will work. All right. So. Oh. 
Yes. Right. We got it. Just figuring out the... Yeah, the timing. <laughs> all right, ready to call them all? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Penn High School team that has been helping work with us on better hand positioning. They've also been helping with some programming on her switch. She's doing awesome. So today we put new, um, they designed little troughs to help hold her hand in because they were falling off and a better way to hold her switches. She comes over here, I think. Hey, Ella, can you drive right up to me so I can show the camera your switches? Now we didn't rebuckle your seatbelt, so no accident. Okay, very good. Very good. Are you liking it? Are they doing a good job? Cool. Nicely done, Ella. Yeah, you can go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, unmute my mic. Sorry about that, guys. So, um, so as you can see there, hopefully you guys could hear that. And Valerie, I'll, I'll get to your, your question in a second. Hopefully you guys could see that this is a little girl um, we were helping in Elkhart, Indiana. And she's one of our first big success stories, right? So Ella, Ella Hunt had SMA type 1. Uh, at the time, she was 5 or 6 years old. She couldn't drive her power chair. And so I actually made her, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to make it sound like we're letting high school kids make power chairs. That's not, that's not the, the real answer here. Um, and I have, I have a problem. I can't see you guys. So, oh, forget it. I don't care. I don't need to see you guys. So if you need me, don't wave your hand or, or unmute, just type in the chat. Um, but um, I made a device that allow with help from Yonath and Lasco and a few other people that allows her to drive her power chair. So right turns right, left turns left, and uh, both go straight. And th by the way, this is going to drive me berserk. I, I know this is bad. This is bad TV right here. I'm sorry, but I have to do it because I can't even. Uh, one sec. One sec. Okay, sorry. If I can't see you guys and I can't see myself, I can't tell when I'm on camera, and it drives me absolutely berserk. I have a little bit, a little bit of OCD in me. I'm sorry. So, um, but we were working with Ella uh, to make her something where she could drive her power chair. So we made a box that had um, left turns left, right turns right, and both goes forward. And that seems simple, and it seems like her chair should have been able to do it. It probably could have. We had to add a little bit of logic. So that when she was going forward and she let up on one, it would curve rather than stop and spin and some other things like that. But these are all pretty basic logic things that we could do. Um, the more, more interesting thing happened when we engaged with her local community, her local AT community. So um, this is one of my favorite pictures. If any of you have ever seen me uh, give a presentation before, I, you probably saw this picture before. My all time favorite. Uh, it's got Ella in the middle, and everybody understands why Ella. Uh, is benefiting from the work that AT Makers does, right? We made her able to drive her power chair. But everybody else in this picture is really getting something amazing, right? So uh, this woman over here on, on the right, I don't know if you can see my screen. Let me see if I can get a, a little marker or something. Uh, so, so this woman over here is her physical therapist, and she's delighted that, that this child is now mobile and getting the input to her brain through motion, right? Um, which is huge. She's now moving around the space. Uh, to the right of her is her mom, Erica. This is, um, this is Ella's mom, who is delighted to see her daughter playing tag with a high school kid. They're in, they're in an area. If, if you look, there's this, this big area here, this big gray area. And you saw it in the, in the video clip where they've taken their training space for the robotics team, cleared it, and made it someplace where Ella can practice driving her power chair, right? Um, in the back, way back here, you'll see uh, two more kids that are um, have their phones out. And they're not just staring at their phones. They're actually documenting everything that they're doing 
so that they can put together the presentation and win the chairman's award, which they won that year, because there are extrinsic rewards uh, for their for their robotics team in doing this outreach program. And they're they're also they're they're getting something out of it personally, but they, this actually does help them in, in what they're trying to do. And then this this young woman right here, uh, you know, this is Italia Fields. She's um, remarkable. At this time, she is 17 and a half. And if you look, she's having a ball playing tag, and she has to look through a BiPAP mask, um, a tube feeder, uh, the, the harness that holds this child in, and a massive amount of electronics, including you know, you know, things that are keeping her breathing. And she can see the child on the other side who just wants to play tag. And that simply wouldn't have happened if we hadn't engaged them with people who need their help in the AT community. So I, I truly believe that Italia will be um, a better human for, for this experience. I hope she doesn't prove me wrong and end up, you know, you know doing something awful with her life. <laughs> but but I, I haven't talked to her in a while. I should probably touch base with her. But I, I do believe that this is something that is formative for these kids when they actually go out and see the need that, that these people that other folks have who have AT needs and, and disabilities. Um, and and I, this is what we're trying to do, right? It's not just a matter of make lots of, of equipment. You're trying to engage the um, technology and maker community with the assistive technology, which really, I, I hate to say this to, to the OTs and the, and the PTs um, who have their ATPs. And this is going to sound, this is going to sound like an insult. I can't say it any other way. Assistive technology professional, professionals aren't that deep in technology, okay? They, they, know, they know assistive technology very well, and they know the human side of it, and they know how to apply technology to a person with disabilities. But the technology that's there isn't, isn't high-tech, right? It's, it is very useful and very important and critical, but it really helps when you bring high-tech to bear, especially custom high-tech solutions to bear on assistive technology users. So I hope that came out right. Lori will tell you, I love all of you and, and I'm not trying to, to um, I don't know how I could have said that better, but I should have, okay? But that, that's really what this is all about. I'm gonna go through a few, more, um, a few more stories because I think it's important that you'll eventually see a trend which will lead us into kind of the point of this. Uh, this, woman, this woman, this man on the right is Jim Lubin, uh, who's never been called a woman before in his life. Um, Jim Lubin in 1994 had, um, had a, a spinal break. He had uh, transverse myelitis. And at C3, the very top of his spinal cord, um, his spinal cord was cut. And in the matter of a couple hours, he lost all ability to function uh, below his, his neck, uh, woke up with a ventilator, and um, has not moved since 1994. Uh, in 1996, he was at home, and he realized that Nobody, it's a good story. If you ever want to watch his story, it's great. Um, he realized that nobody had any expectations for him other than to keep, keep breathing. And so he decided to reach out and find some ways that he could actually um, continue to live, or like actually live. And so he um, found a, a product through the Neil Squire Society in uh, Canada where he could, using a sip and puff uh, tube, like this one right here, um, he could use Morse code to communicate, to type, to move his mouse and things like that. He uh, taught himself Morse code. He got ridiculously fast with it. He's something to see. Um, and that, uh, that device has helped him to, to actually have a relatively fulfilling, fulfilling life um, for 25 years. Um, he was still using the same device that he got in 1996, two years ago. Uh, when we came in contact with them. And the problem was it was dying. It didn't do some things he wanted, but more importantly, it was this ridiculously expensive device. He had two UPSs on it. He had a UPS, another UPS on that, with a, a power supply, an uninterruptible power supply, um, which you're not supposed to daisy chain those like that. But he was so afraid that it was going to lose power because when it did, he had to get the desktop out of the closet and put the floppy in it to be able to reprogram this device to be able to let him to, to, to communicate. So we made him one. We went and um, we found out what he could do. And we made him a device for about $30 uh, with the help of some folks at Adafruit, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And we made him a sip and puff device. 
and it's about 30 bucks. It, it, trans, it does uh, Morse code. It lets him move his mouse. It actually does a lot more than the old device did. And um, it doesn't require you to reprogram it every time it loses power and things like that. And, and he's thrilled. And it just took somebody with modern technology to be aware of this problem and be interested and to be able to, um, to solve it for him. This young woman is Kylie Kramlick. Kylie is a 16 year old, um, was when I did this, I think she's 18 now. When I did this, she was uh, 16 years old. And she, uh, her mom, you might recognize uh, up here is um, um, uh, Christine Kramlick, who's a PRC rep, a Pranky Romic rep. And they live in Atlanta. And Chris, uh, Kylie had a really simple request. She wanted to be able to open and close her bedroom door. If you've ever had a 16 year old girl, I have had a few of them, um, closing their door gently and calmly is very important. Uh, but not being able to do it at all meant she couldn't keep her cat at, and she couldn't invite people into her room. She she didn't have a space that was hers. And so we got a team. We got a robotics team down here in Florida uh, to donate the equipment. This is actually a, uh, a robotics team motor. Um, this is a device that, that we made uh, with them. And this basically puts this motor on uh, their, on Christine and, and Kylie's, um, uh, Wi-Fi network as a device that you can just say, open the door, close the door, and, and it'll do that. Uh, total cost is probably about $100. Um, a lot of time I actually went into this one because it was easy to do wrong. Um, you might have seen this. We had it at the ATIA Maker Day. We, we made a, a, a replica of it and brought it there. It turns out bringing doors with no walls is, is actually really hard to do. Um, that's a separate problem. What Kylie can do is she can drive her power chair and she has a really good eye gaze system. Um, she has a, a PRC accent uh, using the unity symbols that she uses uh, to, to communicate, to speak. She has cerebral palsy. And um, we added, if you look on here, there's two new buttons for her. And they're separated by some distance. There's a, a green one and a, a red one that says open door and close door. We literally gave her buttons on her screen that would open and close the door. We programmed the device. So we took that little bit of ability she has, the ability to move her eyes effectively, and we were able to take that and put it into a software system that knew how to open and close the doors. This is probably our most controversial project. It really shouldn't be. I do, oh, I haven't mentioned this. There's these QR codes um, on every one of these slides as you go through. If you, if you take your phone and point them at that, because it's something that really is interesting you, um, it will take you to a longer video that is the video for that project, okay? And I'll, I'll put these slides up so you can have access to them as well. Um, Michael Phillips, some of you might have known, um, he passed away last year uh, during COVID, but not, not from COVID. Um, he had uh, spinal mus muscular atrophy type one. Uh, when we did this project, he was 37 years old and he had a, a list of things to do. I don't, he never called it a bucket list. I probably shouldn't either, but that's probably the closest analogy. And when he looked at it, there was a whole lot of things on there that we couldn't help him with. I said, you know, spend the night on a deserted island with a woman that I love. And I'm like, I, I can't do that for you. But one of them literally said, fire a gun with a switch. I, I can fire a gun with a switch, right? I, sure. Let's, let's go do that. Let's go to the range and fire a gun with a switch. So I did not use any of the um, I did not use any of the high school kids because that would have been really bad PR. Uh, but what I did do was I reached out to some friends who, who are uh, in law enforcement. I got in touch with the um, uh, the, uh, the ATF, the uh, it used to be called BATF, but the ATF um, who told us what we had to do in order to be able to legally automate a gun, which is essentially what we did. We got a, a, a holding device called a Ransom Rest from uh, Ransom International, the company that invented them. They sent us the original one that was the one that they patented, and we set it up for them. Found a gun range willing to clear the range for us for a Saturday afternoon and um, had a ball. And from a technical perspective, what we did here was Mike has the ability to or, or had the ability to um, raise and, and basically to wiggle his eyebrow. It's all, all he really had left. In fact, he used an EMG switch um, from Control Bionics uh, to basically, he didn't really move his eyebrow, but it could detect the intention 
to move his eyebrow. And at this point, that's what he had left in terms of motion because SMA had been damaging him for, for 37 years. But he's really good at scanning on his iPad. And one of the big lessons we learned is that people will find a way to use the internet, right? The last thing that AT users want to give up is the internet because that's their connection to the world. A lot of them are into gaming, online gaming. I was talking to, to Chris Young yesterday. He's very into EVE online game. It's a, it's a silly space game that he loves. He absolutely loves it. I shouldn't call it silly, but it, it's, it's a big multi-user um, uh, online game. But the last thing that people will give up is their access to a web browser because it's the way you can communicate with anyone. And so we took it. We took advantage of, of realizing that that we could just leverage that. So rather than trying to figure out how to hook up his switch to a gun, uh, we simply put a web interface on the gun. We didn't put it on the, the public internet. We put it on an intranet. Okay. Um, and so this is the view on the right here that uh, that Mike saw, and it's a camera looking right down the barrel of the gun using a Raspberry Pi. And um, he was able to, to hit this button to arm it or cock it and this button to fire it and it fired the gun. And it's a, it was a wonderful day. And for those of you, there's a few, few who said, oh my God, I can't believe they did this. And some of you may be on, on the left side of the spectrum and saying, I'm anti-gun. Got it. So are they, right? Mike, Mike and his mom, Karen Clay, are radically left. She'll tell you. She said. She'll tell you. She says it in the video. There's nobody left of me, right? Um, but it was something that he, it, it was a totally safe, controlled environment, and it was something that he wanted to experience, right? Um, I, I think that if you watch that, you'll see it wasn't about anything political. It was about expanding this man's world into something that he wanted to do and overcoming that challenge. The important, the important thing here was, in, in terms of what this presentation is about, which I will get to, I promise, um, we took what he was trying to do, right? We took what he was able to do, told him to do it in a way that indicated when he was ready to do it, use the switch to, to, to arm and then fire the gun. We just got what he wanted to do into a piece of software, which was then able to perform the action that he wanted to do. By the way, if there's any of the of the videos that I recommend you watch, it's this one. Because at the end of it, there's a whole big part of this that'll make you feel a little bit better about the country if, you, if you're having a bad day. So watch that one. Um, I mentioned Chris Young a few minutes ago playing EVE Online. This is Chris. He's actually an AT maker in, in two ways. He is a, a recipient of our, our uh, devices, but he's also one of our most prolific um, inventors or, or developers. Um, he made, he designed the device that you're seeing right here on the right-hand side. It's kind of funny. It looks like he's holding it out, uh, but that's actually my hand holding it up in front of the camera. If you look, the, the thumbs don't work out right if it's his hand. Um, but Chris has SMA type 2. He's 65 years old and uh, has made every piece of assistive technology that he uses. If you look, he's made this uh, this blue bracket here that holds his... Um, his joystick in the right position on his on his lip. Uh, he invented this sling ring that goes on his hand that gives him the ability to activate six different things um, by cording these. So he can either do one, two, three, one and two, two and three, or all three together. And he can do six different activations using this, this switch. Um, that kind of logic, that kind of hey, I've only got the ability to move my thumb, but I can activate three different switches and I can do two of them at a time. What can I do with this? Well, okay, let's figure out how to do it. And Chris has done it amazingly well. And he did it well before he knew us or anything else he was doing this. Um, he has joined our group and, been, and it's been remarkable what, we, what we've now done together. But um, he has been digitizing his intent for 30 years, right? Uh, and he learned early that if he could get what he was trying to express into a piece of software, then everything else became possible. He created something called uh, the Ultimate Remote, which is this device here that we've, we've got, that we're holding up, that controls his speech generating device, it controls his keyboard and mouse on his, on his computer, all of the TVs and, and, and um, media in his house, his 3D printer, 
He can call to alert his caregiver that his trach needs suctioned. Uh, he controls his environment. He he also uh, the, the 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 remote doesn't actually do it. His his power chair is controlled by the thing that he built on his neck. And then his, his dad built him this kind of remarkable bathtub, which we put in the video as well. Um, in most of these cases, at least the first six of those things, all of it had to do with taking what he could do. He can move his lip and he can move his thumb and he can talk. So he uses dragon, um, naturally speaking, uh, as well. Let's take the small amount of things that we can capture out of Chris, which is unfortunately very small, right? And let's see how many ways we can apply this and what tools we can do to, mat to, to multiply the ability uh, that he has. This is the, the Steve Spawn in the, in the Able Gamers group. Some of you may already know Steve. He's, um, uh, this, this is him on the, on the left. Um, Steve came up to me at a conference in Pittsburgh and asked if I could help him um, take his power chair and uh, get the joystick that he uses for his power chair to be able to control his gaming system. And there are some, some power, some, some characters nowadays have a blue stick, a blue, blue tooth ability to pair with your computer, which is fabulous. Just use that if, if that's what it is. But if you've got like a, one of the little tiny micro light or uh, mini proportional joysticks and things that have basically this ending on them. I don't think you're gonna be able to see this. Oh, here, you can see it on the picture. Sorry. You're looking at the uh, screen. I'm, I'm trying to hold it up. If they have this nine pin connector right here, um, you can disconnect that from your chair, plug it into this little device we made and plug that into your computer or your um, or your gaming system, like an Xbox or the adaptive controller um, and get that into another system, make it a mouse, make it a joystick. Um, so again, we're taking not only the ability that they have that it shows their attention, but also the muscle memory that they've learned and that they've worked forever to be able to, to get the power chair to work, let's reuse that and let them use that, 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 same, not, that same ability in another fashion. Let, let's shift that to another realm. We fo follow that up, um, and I, I will show you this when we're, when we're live again in a second. Um, we then went on a tour right before COVID hit. I started a tour. I didn't get to finish it because I never made it, made it to Maryland. Um, but we went to Steve's. We went to Chris's, we went to Ella's down here. This is Ella. And they all flew a drone. And if you ever want to make anybody happy, but I don't want to say anybody with a disability, but especially people with mobility challenges, let them fly a drone. I have never seen happier people uh, than when I put the goggles on and let Ella or Chris or Steve fly around their neighborhood and, and experience the, that ability to explore that, that has really been a challenge their whole life. So... We didn't do anything new for this, right? This is what's important about this screen is, you know, Chris is still, you know, Chris is still using the controller uh, for his power chair that he's been using forever. Uh, now it can fly a drone. Ella is still using the two switches that we gave her to drive her chair. They can now fly a drone. And, and Steve is now using exactly the same freedom wing that we, we used before. We just repurposed it to apply it to a different uh, end, end point. So what do all these things have in common? What worked, right? And that comes down to this. If you can take somebody's intent and digitize it, and by digitize, I know it's, it's a geek word. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But what it means is you can take that motion. You can take that eye, that, that eye motion. You can take the ability to hit a switch, the ability to move you know, a tiny bit of your thumb, uh, move your lip. You can take a tiny a bit. And rather than saying, what's the tool that lets me use my lip to drive a power chair? Say, how do I take the motion of my lip and get it into some piece of, of, of technology? Some, get it into the software. Make that an input to something that we can reprogram a million different ways to do the things that you want. Okay. And a lot of you now will be coming up with something very true, which is, but I, I, I can't program. I can't do that. This is kind of why, why we're here. Um, the process in every one of these cases uh, starts with capture some physical action, capture some way 
of, of capturing the intent of the user. And I will tell you that my, my um, go-to on this is if I can, as a human being, if I can tell your intent, then I should be able to find a sensor to be able to digitize that intent. The best example I have, I know I'm out of your screen here, sorry, but I have one. I happen to have one right next to me. Sorry. So here, let me stop sharing. I'll show you this. Um, there you go. All right. So if you guys can, uh, hopefully you guys can see my, my screen. This little device right here, this here, this thing right here, okay? is really flat, it's a little piece of nothing, okay? It's called an FSR. And what it's called, a four, it's a force sensitive resistor. What it means is that if I squeeze this, right? And this is plugged into a little microcontroller, I can tell how hard I'm squeezing it. I don't have to pull my finger off, I can tell. And a really easy way to do it is if you take this and you put it on your own thumb and have the AT user push against your thumb, if you can feel the fact that they're they're pushing on it, so can this device. This device is five dollars. Okay. Um, if we can get, let me go back to the screen here for a second. If we can get the physical motion captured into some piece of software, then we come in here and we we add a little bit of logic, like in Chris's case, when I press number switch one, two, and three, it does one thing. When I press one and two together or two and three together, or all three together. They're, they're separate things, that's called cording. We had a little bit of logic. And we do this on tools that we all already have, whether that's a cell phone, um, a microcontroller, a Raspberry Pi. I have, I, I have just a ridiculous amount of, um, of equipment, all of which does exactly that thing, that stuff. And then, we solve the action on the right, whatever it is. I want to make a phone call. I want to do uh, turn my lights on and off. And the problems on the right are solved. We already know how to turn our lights on. We use if this, then that. We use Alexa. We use the hue bulbs. Like automation is already here. We just need to get the glue together to be able to say this person with this limited mobility can now do that intent. If you might, you might have picked up on this, the left-hand side is AT specific and ATPs are trained how to do this, how to make sure there's no fatigue, how to do placement correctly. Um, everything on the right has nothing to do with AT, right? Process and logic has nothing to do with AT. Uh, being able to automate actions happens all the time outside of the context of um, disability or, or uh, limited mobility. Um, so this breaks down pretty well to ATPs and makers, which is kind of our point at AT Makers, right? Um, we have some partners that actually have worked with us on this. These, these are uh, two women from the maker community that you should know. Certainly the woman on the far right over here, Lamore Freed, you definitely should know who she is. Um, Lamore is the founder of Adafruit.com, one of the largest maker technology uh, manufacturers in the country. And by the way, I'm, I'm gonna speed up a little. I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, she is, she's wonderful. And I do want to get her video in here so you guys can see this. She was asked the question, what do you think is going to happen in the next uh, five years in the maker movement? And the first thing she said was, it's not going away. And the second thing she said was this. If, if you're someone who needs special hardware and you don't have that skill set, it can be very, very expensive and challenging to get that stuff made for you. But there's people in the maker community who are like, oh, you know, you just need a really big button that sends a keyboard press to your iPad. And there's just nothing on earth that does that. Um, and so, like, I'll make that for you. And so the ability to custom ha make hardware, that, and, and that ties together with open source hardware, right? If it isn't open source, it's not possible to do. So having open source hardware and have it be easy for people to customize it has allowed the accessibility, uh, accessible technology community really mesh well with the maker community, which I think is very interesting. And one note about the Thank you, Adam. I'm so glad I had the, the chat up. That would have been awful. So the point to take away from that, thank you. Um, the point to take away from that is they love the fact 
that they're able to bring their solutions to bear on the AT community. And it meshes perfectly. Um, that's a long, there's a longer, um, a longer video you can watch there if you'd like, but uh, it is something to recognize. We're working with Google and Microsoft and Logitech and Adafruit and SparkFun and all of these companies um, that want to be involved in this. So we've got, we got friends. Adafruit actually made all of these devices on the bottom for us in order to, to let us uh, succeed. This one right here is actually, whoops, this one that says MPRLS is actually the one that uh, lets Jim Lubin speak. Um, all of these are, are things that they've made in order to support us. How do we make this official? How can you guys actually work on this? We actually have a process that we're tr trying to teach now. We're working with uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Ben Satterfield up at the, uh, the Institute for Inclusive Design. Um, and we're trying to get a, a joint um, program in, this, in the colleges that teaches ATs, uh, OT, OTs first, uh, ATPs, um, how to collaborate with technologists. And it teaches the engineering students how to create things with non-standard bodies in mind, how to work with the AT community to be able to get their, their products to include a broader spectrum of, of um, the folks that we're, that we're working with in the world. I mean, we are all going to eventually need assistive technology, right? Or we're going to be dead. Those are your two options. Um, so we need to get that into the, the, um, the system. The impact process is how we're going to do that. There are some, some perils here. Um, the biggest one is this. I'm not going to go through everything on the slide, but neither skills nor co collaboration are taught today. We don't teach the OTs how to do electronics, and we don't teach them how to collaborate with engineers. And engineers are weirdos. I'm one of them. I get to say it. Um, but we really are not the easiest people in the world to work with. Um, and, and to be fair, uh, from a very practical standpoint, working with, with uh, AT users is, not, is pretty challenging as well but it's not taught and it's not even uh, encouraged. So um, I'm not gonna go through how we, how did we get here. I don't think it's helpful at this point with just a couple minutes left. What is important is we, we need to remember something. If you can take away, if, if you can take the user's intent and you can get it into a system, then we can digitize it and we can make any device that you need to control their world. The important thing is to reliably and consistently be able to get their intent into the system. So what I would suggest to you, and, and I, I know I kind of skipped some things here, but what I would suggest to you as we go forward is when you're looking at somebody that you're trying to help, when you've got a family member or you're, you're a caregiver for somebody and you hit a, a line where you can't figure out how it is you're going to, to get that, that thing activated. You're going to be able to control the speech device. Um, when you get to the point where you don't find an easy solution in the AT closet, right? Um, just realize if you can get a human to see the intent, you're not done yet. If there's not a product that's available, come find us, come to AT Makers, go to Makers Making Change, go to Therese Wilcom, in, um, in uh, New Hampshire, who just called me this morning. Um, there are people out here in our community who actively will find the solution and help you to get that intent into a system. And once you've done that, right, once you've gotten that person's intent digitized, it's now a very solved problem. There's a thing called if this, then that. You should take a look at it. I don't have it on my slides, but if this, then that will let you... Um, basically daisy chain anything you want. So when you say something into Alexa, you want it to send a message to your sister in Florida that you know, it will do all of those things. That, that's magical. And it's not AT technology. It's just technology, right? So as you go forward, I hope you consider that. I'm sorry I ran a little bit over. I did, I did run a little bit over. Are there any questions here um, in chat or just turn off your mic or turn off your mute um, for me? At this point, um, I, do this is Val. I had that one question posted and you said you'd get back to it. Oh, sure. You said uh, <laughs> I, have, I have some high school people. You refer to the project as the LIU AT Makers uh, program. AT Makers. LIU is where I work. <laughs> gotcha. So um, we, we don't have any problem with that. What I would suggest, if it is a high school team, if it's a STEM class or a club, um, also reach out to ATMakers.org because 
So you have a space in there. It's AT Makers, and I'm good with that. If you put the, if you get rid of the space, it kind of feels like a brand, uh, a trademark issue. Mm -hmm. But um, also, we would love to have them be one of our affiliates, right? It yeah, doesn't cost anything. Like this is like in its infancy. I had gotten this grant. I got these kits. I've gotten like two. One's a club, and one's a class at two districts in our area. Yeah. And so it's like they're just learning, like yeah. so, how to do it. It's so very much in infancy. Join <laughs> made some 3D printed key guards for me, and I have some people, some switch adapting toys. One of the other classes, they've repaired some things for me. But so, so here are the things I would recommend: don't throw away your old IntelliKeys, keys, because we can actually rescue those now, and they can help you do it. And okay. and I don't know uh, if I even have any anymore. <laughs> So also, um, go join the AT Makers Facebook group. That's probably what I'd recommend for all of you. Yeah, I'm on there already. Gotcha. And, and tell us, and we'll, we'll be happy to, um, we, we have a whole video on how to work with your high school robotics teams. Um, and we're happy to, we would rather have you be a, use the, use the name as an official thing. Um, but you're also welcome to use it without with the space in there you're absolutely fine on okay your... yeah i was just nervous i'm like is this like nah. i've been trying to call them like makers but like they don't you know i want you funny, it's funny something i learned and this can maybe help other people you really don't know what other people don't know they're like well okay they're willing to switch adapt these toys but they don't get it why do kids need that i actually had to like find videos online of kids using switch toys so they knew why what they were doing like i just assumed way too much knowledge on yep. the teacher's behalf and the student's behalf so yeah and that's why i make that the at slide when i talk to google and stuff mm -hmm. they, they really don't know but i, I also will, will tell you that um one one tip i'll give you is get the um get the high school kids to come in direct contact with the recipients and i'm trying yeah. to do that yeah, yeah. it's, it's COVID and things it's making that a little bit difficult yep. but yeah because i have some relationships with some folks like who they're switch adapting the toys for be great if i said if they could be the ones to deliver the toys and meet the kids in the in the elementary and preschool classes who were using these as a yep. leisure time activity or you know you fixed this light right. tech at device for them right. this is a kid actually using it i've been yeah I, it's that, that's my intent but I have had I've had trouble where um, pre-COVID even where people didn't understand the value of that, and they actually like gave away the toys and and they they had the the big event with the news people there at three o'clock on an exam day in December so that none of the high school kids could go and didn't even tell them about it. I was livid, um, and I, so I've I've actually kind of got it built into our procedures now where we figure out whether it's Zoom or something. Our the kids we work with know. They, they meet the people that they're helping. And, and it's kind of, um, it, it's not as important when you're dealing with adults. It's a, it's a, hi, Valerie. Uh, so it's a real person. So I know. It's not as important when it's adults and when it's, um, uh, you, know, you know, Google or, or Microsoft. But when it's the teens, it's so important that they see a human on the other side of this. That, that is one of the, the things that I think it might be better for them than for the AT user. So, right, and these are kids like who are in, could are from their district or at least from their county or district neighboring districts these are and the teacher had even said well these kids have never even seen a child who had significant physical disabilities before and you know right. like i said i sent some videos i found on youtube and things of that but i just think of yeah i did talk to the teacher about that being more meaningful if they could actually meet yep. the kids yep absolutely and feel free to use that picture of italia that i, that I, I mean it's a really it's, you can talk to it pretty well. People get the fact that, oh, yeah, all these people benefit from this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you're doing it. That's great. So, all right. I'm just glad I'm not like, breaking any, any copyright infringements because I was super worried about that. <laughs> if, you're ever, if you're spending any time on whether or not I'm going to sue you, you can stop. I don't have any money, so I'm a speech pathologist by background. I work for an <laughs> yeah. educational facility. I don't have any money, so. There you go. You won't get right. much. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Thank before? you. You're welcome. Anybody else? We're all good. I think we probably are down to just a few people left. Oh, actually, most of you are still here. Uh, you're welcome to type your questions if you want or unmute your mic. That's fine, too. Or we can uh, let you go get lunch, which is what I'm going to do. Adam, I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for telling me my mic was off. I think we're good. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.
and have a good time at the the DRNJ thing. Have I seen Lucy for power wheelchairs? I think that's the ring that goes on it and gives the. Uh, I'll take a look. L U C I. I'll take a look for power wheelchair. Uh, Julia. By the way, I'm also eight. Uh, I'm. I didn't show my my thing. Let me do this uh, real quick. Uh, if you need to reach me, I'm really easy to reach. I'm just bill at atmakers.org right here. It's real tricky. Um, Lori, I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Good to hear from you again. Mohammed, you're welcome. Jennifer, thank you. Glad you thought it was informative. I think we're probably out. Let me see. Anybody still here? I think we're good. Adapt.